Welcome everyone to this Asia Society Korea book event. We're really delighted to welcome a good friend of mine and a friend of the Asia Societies and, and just a great scholar uh, of, of all things Korea, North and South, Ramon Pacheco Pardo. Uh, many of you know, he's professor of international relations at King's College London. And he is also the KF, Korea Foundation, VUB Korea Chair at the Brussels School of Governance. So Ramon, first of all, welcome and thank you so much for making time to do this. Thanks to you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. So um, Ramon, you are honestly one of the most prolific scholars I know out there. Um, it's hard to keep up with your op-eds, with your articles, your essays, and even your books. Um, but even you have a finite amount of time. So the first question I want to ask is, why did you decide to write this particular book? Could you tell us kind of the origin story or the, the ultimate aim of, of this book uh, from shrimp to whale? Did I get the, the title right? Absolutely, yes, shrimp to whale, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think that, yeah, to be honest, goes back to, to when I first lived uh, in, in Korea, because uh, I remember uh, my friends were looking for something to give me before I went to Korea, and, and they could only come up with a couple of books. One of them was on North Korea. Uh, this was back in Spain. And the other one uh, was a, a, a guide, a guidebook, actually, to, to the country, right? Uh, and since then, I realized, of course, now there's much more scholarship on, on, on South uh, Korea, uh, but I felt that uh, maybe there were not that many books around focusing on the history of the South only. There are many books, uh, great books, focusing on the history of Korea, uh, and, and I felt that when it comes to South Korea only, uh, we don't have that, that many. There are some books that focus on different aspects, of course, if we talk about non-academic books. So that was one reason, and I think the second reason really had to do with the increase uh, in attention to the country that I've seen uh, over the over the years uh, also being a professor myself in the growing number of students who were interested in South Korea again not necessarily in, in, in Korea as a whole uh, Northeast Asia for a multitude of reasons uh, of course the culture uh, being uh, the main one uh, K-pop K-dramas movies uh, but also uh, interest in, in, in the politics of the country, in the economic development of the country, which is made more long-standing. So it was a combination of, of factors, and that's uh, what led me to be interested in writing this book, and the publishers were interested from, from day one on the idea. Well, we're very glad that you made the choice. I'm very glad, having uh, read the book and, and learned so much from it. And maybe I'll come back to that issue of it's very interesting of sort of how you treat the North, North and South. Um, okay, so I always tell my students, you know, teaching history classes about how important it is to reflect on when you start and end your history and how that choice kind of shapes. It's, it's the decision make, that makes decisions for you. Um, so I'd be curious if we could start with your starting point. Why did you start with 1948? On the one hand, you could say it's obvious, but of course, um, there are other possible starting points. 1919 might be the other most common one. And I, I wonder if you considered others um, and sort of just how you approach that question of where to begin your story. Y yes, absolutely. I, I did consider uh, others, as you say, um, late 19th century, early 20th century, 1919 as well, 1945, of course, when, with the end of the occupation of of, of Korea. Uh, and I think I, I settled for 1948 precisely to emphasize that there was a history of South Korea. And of course, there is a background chapter, right, in which uh, I actually cover, summarize, not cover, but summarize uh, the history of, of Korea, dating back a uh, millennia, really. Uh, but then I said, well, if the book is going to be a South Korea, as you said, maybe there is an obvious starting point, which is when, when was the country created? When was the country established? Uh, why don't we start uh, there, obviously considering the background uh, information that I mentioned from, from previous uh, uh, decades, uh, centuries and millennia. But uh, there was also this um, thinking process, right, when I was about to submit the proposal uh, to the publisher, which is if 
I didn't know anything about Korean history or about uh, South Korea. What would I consider to be the starting point? And I thought, well, someone who doesn't know anything about South Korea uh, may look online and say, well, South Korea was created in 1948. So, so what am I reading about 1945 or 1919, for example, right? I, of, of course, you can explain that, but that was also part of the, of the thinking process. Uh, and, and I said, okay, let's settle down for 1948. Uh, and then also have more space to actually cover South Korean history per se, and not so much the, the background information that you necessarily need to give in, in a country with such a long history uh, when we talk about Korea. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, you mentioned the prologue. I, I was astonished at how much time you covered uh, in the prologue, it's really a masterful distillation of kind of the entirety of Korean history <laughs> from 2333 BC right up to 1948. So, um, but I want to jump us forward a bit in your story to um, I, I can't remember which number the chapter is, but you've got a chapter on Park Jung Hee. You call it the Park Jung Hee era, and I was thinking about the choices you made about time in each chapter and the titles mm -hmm. of chapter and struck me, that's the only one named after an individual. Obviously there's a lot of individuals uh, throughout the book, but, and, and that makes sense to me, my own understanding superficial as it is of South Korean history is that if there's any one individual who, who has had um, a shaping force, if you had to pick one, it's probably him. I wonder if you agree with that, but, but I also want to ask you a really, maybe painful question, which is, you know, from him, his influence in that era, if you had to pick one feature, one legacy that people need to understand from the Park Chung Hee era about South Korea today, what would it be? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question, actually. Uh, I, I think that when studying the history of South Korea, and, and uh, you always have to study it as well, and, and when researching about it, uh, the reason why it is yes, the only chapter that is named after an individual uh, is because I think he was a, a, a pivotal uh, person, not only in the history of South Korea, but I would say more broadly in the history of the of the region, East Asia, when you want to consider Asia uh, as a whole. Uh, because if you look at South Korea, where South Korea is today and the influence that it has, it's not, of course, all down to him, but it was during his period in power uh, when South Korea really started to become what it is today, uh, certainly in economic in economic terms, but also I think in in in, in social terms, because both the contestation to his rule by many South Koreans, but the support that he had from many other South Koreans, it still has an influence uh, today. And even if you look at the the current politics of of South Korea and, and the divisions that you see between uh, left and right. Uh, you cannot say they started with under, under Park, but under Park they were clearly defined uh, the two main blocks that you have in South Korea today, and I think it has an influence beyond uh, the country uh, as well. But even if you look at the art of South Korea, right? If you look at the K-pop, for example, if you look at protest songs that they started in the 1960s and 70s, in the 70s onwards, right? They they, they were. Uh, to an extent, you could argue the starting point of a later became as, as, as capable, right? So you have to understand uh, that as well. And also what I found very interesting uh, about Pak is that I think he's well known in, in East Asia, definitely, and maybe in, in, in Asia as a whole, but not beyond uh, the region, not beyond the continent. And you could argue if he had been the leader of uh, uh, Germany or, or, or France, for example, he would be more well known, right? And I don't want to get into this debate about... Uh, West and East, how much uh, leaders of each of the two parts of the world are. But I, I do think that it is necessary to understand him better in a global context because he, he was a, a, a figure that I think had a global importance because of South Korea today. And that's me to the question, which is what would you highlight, what moment, right, would you highlight of his, um, uh, of his leadership of the of the country, I mean, I think it's a really, really tough question, really difficult. But I think that uh, when I was writing the chapter, one issue that I really wanted to to focus on is his decision to focus really on economic uh, development. Yes, because he, he was an authoritarian leader and later on a, a full blown uh, dictator. But there were many other dictators who didn't emphasize the economic growth of the country as much as he did. 
Uh, and, and we can go into the reasons. And some would say, well, he needed to do this because he hadn't been voted in. So he had to uh, push for economic development for his own legitimacy. There were others who say, well, it was because of nationalism. Of course, his supporters will, will say, well, uh, he was uh, uh, the, the, the godfather in the goodness of the country, right? He was looking for the well-being of his people, right? So there are different interpretations. But what is true is that if you look at many other dictators, and frankly speaking, you only have to look at the, uh, at the North, at, at North Korea, and you could argue that not all leaders uh, were looking for the good of their country. And he could have gone in a completely uh, different direction. He could have said, look, I'm only going to enrich myself and my family. And of course, he enriched himself and his family and his uh, friends and those who were close to him. But it is true that he also uh, tried to make his country more powerful, richer, whatever, whatever the reasons. I mean, the book, I, 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 I delve into this uh, debate as well. Uh, so I think uh, that matters in the particular case of Park, without neglecting, of course, uh, all the bad things that happened during his time in power, like all the repression, killings, of course, and the dictatorship uh, per se. It must have been difficult, um, you know, trying to get that balanced, neutral, dispassionate, maybe is the best word, um, sort of take on the Park era. I thought you did a great job, you know, in, in terms of how, because, of course, the the views to this day, as we know, are are sometimes so diametrically opposed. Um, so I, I want to move us forward a little bit into the 1980s. I, I love that chapter. You call it on the road to riches and democracy. And I'm in particular, I'm particularly interested in the and democracy part. I mean, for me, as a historian of China, I think a lot about South Korea and and China in the 80s and how there are a lot of actual sort of parallels between them. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we're dealing with a communist country and a, and a non-communist country, but basically both dictatorships and South <laughs> Korea goes off, uh, you know, kind of realizing the liberal potential that's been there. Um, and China does not. So I'm just curious, you know, kind of the classic way a historian would think about this is you've got underlying factors and then you've got these sort of contingent factors. You've got individuals. Um, I was struck in the way you tell the story of the real democratization, I guess I was struck by your emphasis. I think you have both, but your emphasis on the contingent factors on, um, you know, No Te Wu is so vivid when you describe kind of the moment when No Te Wu announces mm -hmm. there will be direct election after, uh, you know, as a Yonsei professor, I have to mention, you know, Ihan Yol and that tragedy mm -hmm. of his killing. And, and so it's almost like these, these moments occurred that boom, 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 um, have these profound historical consequences. So uh, long-winded question, how do you make sense of that? You know, the underlying forces, was it inexorable? Do you think it was a matter of time? Versus the contingent forces, actually, South Korea could have gone in a very different direction at that moment. Yeah, no, no, that's a great question, right? Because I think traditionally, there's this idea that economic development uh, brings democracy, right? And calls for democracy and the population of, of different countries. But now we know it's, it's not true. And, and, and you mentioned China. And of course, China had uh, Tiananmen only a couple of years uh, after South Korea held its first uh, truly free elections. Uh, and it went the, the, the other way. So, so that's why I think it's important to understand the, the contingent factors and, and yeah, the pivotal uh, the pivotal moments that we had really in 1987, right? And, and what you see uh, there, I think, is a combination of factors, really the people pushing for, 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 for democracy, right? And, uh, and, and you could have argued that the leaders could have tried to push back against this. Uh, and I think there was, well, I think, no, there was a division uh, within the South Korean elite, right, the South Korean government, whether to continue the dictatorial regime or not. And in a sense, it was the Noteu faction that, of course, uh, he had been part of the of, of the coup uh, uh, that had brought to no one to, 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 to power. But I think he realized, uh, well, the country is moving in a different direction. And, and if we continue the dictatorship, I think it would have been a pretty brutal what we have seen, even more brutal, maybe what we have seen in, in, in South Korea. You could have seen, uh, for example, a uh, new Kwan for example, uh, across the country, 
uh, because clearly the people didn't want a dictatorial regime anymore. Uh, and they were ready for, for, for democracy and they were calling for it. And I think uh, the contingent factors, is, uh, when you see uh, different movements coming together, the student movement and the worker movement have been there for a longer period of time, but then you have the rise of the uh, women's rights movement, but they also call for democracy. Uh, but also you see office workers, right, who had really benefited from the economic growth of, of South Korea. And I find this very interesting when, when conducting research, right, and you can actually, you have a very good, uh, uh, KBS uh, uh, on, online has a, a, a very good um, um, access to videos, right? Like historical videos, right? And you can watch them online and they're very vivid, right? And you see uh, these uh, people dress in very different ways, right? But protesting against the regime, I find this is very uh, interesting. And the Notebu uh, famous speech, you can also watch it online. I mean, this in my case, because I come from a country that lost a transition from the dictatorship to democracy, right? So we have similar historical speeches, right? And, 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 and times, I felt it very vividly because I felt, well, this is what uh, we went by uh, in Spain. And, and to think, obviously, I, I was very little when this happened in Korea, right? And I didn't know about it. But if I had been a Korean watching this speech, I would have been like, wow, this is, uh, this is amazing. This is, a, this is certainly a new era, right? And, and I'm watching the speech. I watched it several times, actually, from time to time. Mm-hmm. I revisited, uh, I, I think is a fascinating uh, point in time. Uh, and I think that the important uh, time there actually in the 1917, the important moment uh, was uh, the election actually taking place, but the post election, there being no contestation of the results uh, because the left could have said, right? Uh, this election had been rigged as many have been in the past, right? Uh, but they didn't. Uh, they accepted the result of the election. I think there was a pivotal movement uh, as well, uh, because that meant that there were no protests, right? The people accepted, well, uh, yes, we have someone from the previous regime, but he had been elected, uh, period, right? There's not much we can do. We have to accept it. And I think that was quite important as well, uh, because that consolidated, in a sense, uh, what people had been pushing for uh, over the previous months and years. There was no stop the steal. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, in this way, South Korea is really a almost textbook case of a, of a smooth transition, soft landing from authoritarian to an actual democratic system where, uh, you have this, this one moment where kind of the outgoing old regime gets to hold on, uh, as, as actually consolidates the movement. That, that's fascinating. Um, Roman, when I was at this point in your in your book, this sort of cross cutting question occurred to me, which is about the role of the United States. Mm. Um, And uh, of course, the U.S., you know, various presidents and administrations are appearing throughout. There's a little bit of a pattern of Washington kind of prodding, you know, hopes and fears. Uh, Kennedy pressures Pac Mm. to hold an election. Mm. Um, LBJ wants troops in Vietnam. Reagan wants Chun Doo Hwan to, you know, liberalize the economy. Um, but those are just a few cases. Uh, obviously, you're threading it throughout. And I'm just curious, when you step back, how do you see the historic role of the United States? And to link it to your title, I mean, after all, the United States is one of the whales here, right? Like you, you, yes. within South Korea, it's always ally, ally, kachi, kachi, da. But when we look very coldly at this in a historical context, South Korea, I mean, the United States is arguably the biggest whale. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd just like to hear your big picture thinking about that, having done all this work for this book. It's interesting because it goes back to the point that you make about the Back on here, right? I mean, I was quite dispassionate because at the end of the day, I see it as an outsider, right? If I was writing about Spain, I had to write about Franco, it would be more difficult than writing about Korea. And, and, and it's the same, I think, uh, with the role of the United States, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not American, I'm, I'm, I'm not Korean, right? So I take a fairly dispassionate uh, view. I have no alliance to defend, so to speak, or to criticize, uh, right? Depending <laughs> where you see it in the political spectrum. But, and I find uh, interesting that if you focus on South Korea, yes, the U.S. is clearly the biggest whale. We're not talking about history here. We're not talking about the role of China or Japan in the, in the past because we're focusing on, on South Korea. Uh, and there is no way around it. It has been a very important uh, 
country, an inflation country, in the politics, not only in the economics uh, and security of, of, of South Korea. And in, in, in my view, what is interesting is that there have been these periods in U.S. history in which the U.S. was pressing for South Korea to become more democratic, more liberal in economic terms, and other periods in which they were pressing South Korea not to go down this road, right? So, for example, there was a um, good rapport um, with the Chunda Wan government, for example, in the beginning of, of his government, not later on. Uh, when the U.S. was actually asking for for, for, for for democracy. But even during the PAC year, of course, uh, sometimes, as you said, Kennedy was pushing uh, for PAC to hold uh, elections, right? Uh, some other times uh, in, in the history of relations between uh, South Korea and, 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 and the U.S. and, the, and, and their PAC, this wasn't the case, right? The uh, U.S. presidents were fairly comfortable with uh, with the uh, with the dictatorial regime that, that, that South Korea... Uh, had and it's the same with the, the economics. Right? This calls for liberalization in the 1980s and 1990s. They didn't really happen before, right? When South Korea simply had to become rich uh, for the US to show the success of uh, a non communist country vis a vis, uh, vis, -a -vis no North Korea. Uh, so I think it's difficult to say the US has behaved in a particular way. There's a historical trajectory here because I think. Even within the U.S., there have been divisions depending on the administration that was in power, and also within the administration, because it depends also sometimes on the personality of the U.S. Uh, ambassador, right? And some U.S. ambassadors were more involved in uh, South Korean politics. Some others took a more uh, hands-off uh, approach, uh, and I had the chance to talk to, to, to several of them when, when preparing for, for, for the book. And this true, some of them, they simply saw their role as uh, transmitting the message of the U.S. government to South Korea and others felt it more personally for whichever reasons, right? And they wanted to become more involved uh, in uh, influencing uh, uh, South Korean politics, of course, behind uh, uh, closed doors uh, very often, right? So that's why I think is, is I, I wouldn't say that the U.S. had played a particular role. I think it has depended on a historical context. And I think it also depends on the South Korean uh, president and, and and there's this cliche that liberal presidents try to distance themselves from, from from the US and conservatives are closer to the US but I think also depends on the on, on the historical moment and and the president uh, him or herself because for example if, if you look at uh, someone like um uh, uh Nomu Hyun who who was seen as someone who wanted to distance himself a little bit more from the US but then he's the one who pressed for an FTA with the U.S. Actually, he went against domestic opposition from came from his camp for an FTA because he thought this was good for the South Korean economy. So that's quite interesting because in this case, you saw closer economic relations because of a liberal president who traditionally had been seen as more uh, opposed to strong relations with the U.S. because he thought it was good for his country, right? So I think you have to go to this uh, granular data, really, to use an academic term, uh, to see what happened between the U.S. And, and South Korea. Yeah, I mean, side sidebar, I find that uh, in terms of both U.S. and China, that the there's caricatures of what a liberal and what a conservative, mm -hmm. at least what they say. But when you look hard at what they do, uh, which is what a lot of history is, it's like, really? <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, and 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 again, it's especially you've certainly proven the need for more Spaniards to write this history because mm -hmm. that dispassionate view you have is really refreshing and and illuminating, uh, certainly for me. Um, Ramon, I loved the chapter "Freedom and Crisis," kind of Olympics to to IMF uh, crisis, as we call it here. I wonder it it, it struck me. Um, first of all, that that period seems to get less attention. Do you think that's true? Like the, the presidents, No Tae Wu, Kim Yong Sam are among the less discussed. Uh, uh, and I feel like maybe you've got heroes and villains who tend to get attention in history. You know, Chun Do Hwan's pretty much a villainous figure. Kim mm -hmm. Dae Jong, largely a heroic figure. Uh, and then you kind of it's harder to know what to do with these um, leaders in between. So I wonder if you agree with that as part of it. But the other thing I want to hear more from you is I was struck by how much of, you know, kind of the Korea that, that we know now emerges from the 90s. I mean, you trace the K-pop stuff even further back, but I feel like it's at this point that's like, oh, really? Wow, that started then? Oh, yeah, that, you know, Shiri came out or maybe that was a little later, but it's kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, you get this 
this um, hip Korea, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of emerging. And then also just all the, the which you do so well, the economic juggernaut, you know, and this kind of mixture of uh, global capitalism with still a big state role, you know, different than than the China state led capitalism, but also different from just a straight uh, free market ideology. So I, um, I, what what really stuck out for you about this period? I mean, what would be something that like you maybe found in the course of the research that you hadn't realized before? And do you see this as, as in a way the turning point, you know, that like the Korea we know mm -hmm. emerges then? I, I think it's a pivotal moment. Uh, absolutely. And I agree with you that often we look at 1988 right, uh, 1978, Korea becomes a democracy, Seoul Olympics, uh, and then 1997, the Asian financial crisis, right, and crisis, right, and if nothing happened in, in, in between, and, and I think uh, yeah, that's obviously uh, not true, uh, but I also think that three important issues, first of all, it's true that you can press a cape upon the rise of Korean arts to, to, to um, earlier in history, but it is true that this is the, the point in time when uh, censorship uh, stops uh, in Korea. And that's when you really see uh, artists becoming more creative because they can, because they're not going to be censored uh, anymore, right? Uh, and this is uh, filmmakers, uh, definitely, but also uh, pop stars that uh, they can start singing about whatever they want and they can dress in any way they want. And this is not going to be censored. There is not going to be... Uh, official censorship from 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 the government, and it's very interesting that when you look at Seo um, uh, and Boys, right? Uh, their song Nana Rayo, which is considered to be the first uh, K-pop song. Of course, this is disputed, but it's interesting because now you go to the Museum of Contemporary History in Korea, and actually the song is being shown there, right? Because it is a pivotal uh, moment, right? The, this is the early 1990s. And uh, South Korean artists are experimenting. They're being influenced uh, by, by the US, uh, by the countries as well. To extent, some people say would say Japan or Hong Kong even, right? Uh, but they're mixing this with the Korean uh, roots and they're coming out with what today we call uh, K-pop, right? So, so this goes to the Korean times and with filmmaking. And it has started to internationalize a little bit before the Asian financial crisis, of course, before in, in the beginning with the neighbors, right? It starts with, uh, with, with, with China, Taiwan, uh, Japan, and Sydney as, uh, as well, right? Uh, so what we have today as a global phenomenon can be traced back to this point in time. But I think also something very interesting that this actually starts with uh, conservatives, governments, and liberals are going to continue with this is if you look at the uh, economic model uh, and the development of what you call a, a, a modern welfare state, I mean, you can trace this back all the way to the, to the pack years, if, if, if you want, 1970s. Uh, but it is true that this is a point in time uh, when you see, start to see a different economic model uh, in which there is uh, less focus on growth per se, but also on the uh, well-being of the uh, workers, well-being of the as well. And of course, this is related to the uh, South Korean workers pressing for this, right? Uh, so this happened in time when, when uh, South Korean salaries, for example, the, the, the average wage uh, grows up dramatically, late 1980s, early 1990s. In many cases, it, it, it triples uh, in a matter of, of year salaries, right? Uh, and yes, this is workers pressing for it, but this coincided with the conservative governments in, in South Korea. So you cannot say it's only the liberals uh, pushing for better uh, uh, working, uh, worker conditions. Actually, they started during this period of time uh, as well, and a different economic model. And the third aspect also related to the economic model, this is when South Korean companies realize they have to become innovative, right? Because this is uh, the time when uh, China is clearly going to become more liberalized in economic terms. Uh, it is going to become an economic uh, uh, juggernaut and, and even before it joined the, the WTO. But South Korean business people, obviously being right next to China, they have already realized this. They, they have realized, well, the economy is opening, it's going in one direction. We actually are going to have to compete with China and we cannot do it on wages. Uh, China is going to be able to undercut us, right? And this is when uh, your Samsung, LG, uh, Hyundai, other uh, um, 
uh, Chevel, but also smaller companies, for example, in the biotech sector, they say, well, we have to become uh, innovative, other, otherwise we're going to be uh, taken over by China, or we're going to become an appendix of, of, of China. I think that's important because w- when you look at the, the innovation that really drives the South Korean economy today, and we talk about, you know, in semiconductors, uh, uh, green ships, for example, electric batteries, uh, you can trace this back to the 1990s, uh, the change in mentality from many companies and economic growth model. Yes, it goes back to the 1980s, but really in the 1990s, when the threat of China is real in economic terms, uh, they have to innovate. So that's an important change that later on continued, definitely. So another um, sort of theme that you develop, and, and I was very struck by this and learned a lot from it, you, you develop it, I think, throughout each chapter, and then it, it gets a little bit stronger and stronger as we go into the next chapter on liberal, I think you call it liberal South Korea, is um, gender equality, the role mm-hmm. of women in Korean society, relations between men and women. Um, so I'd be curious if you can maybe just give the reader a taste of, again, kind of your the, the big picture for you, the snapshot of how you, over the course of writing this book, maybe you rethought the whole question of uh, women's quest for equality. And I think at this mm-hmm. point, Korean men also quest for, mm-hmm. uh, you know, gender relations that, that work. <laughs> um, so I'd, I'd just be curious your thoughts on that, because it's, it's clearly quite, quite a deliberative choice that you bring that to the fore uh, throughout the, the telling of the history. I, I think this is crucial, really, uh, to South Korean uh, contemporary history. So one thing that I did extensively, actually, uh, I, I consulted, of course, with uh, uh, female uh, academics and thinkers, right? Uh, but also with friends, right? Because uh, I also wanted to, to tell the, the, their story, right? And that's something that I found very interesting because that led to focusing not only on the, on the struggle for gender equality in, in, in Korea, but also showing the successes of women over time. And that's something that many uh, women that I actually interviewed or talked to or listened to <laughs> more than talked to uh, for the book, they told me, look, uh, it's good that you mentioned uh, the, the push for gender uh, equality that you can really trace back uh, to, the, to the 1970s in the case of, of, of Korea, but also show uh, where we are, right? Uh, don't present us as victims because m- many felt this is not this is not the case, and I found that very interesting. That's what I tried to to do. Uh, and yes, I think that the 1990s and 2000s is is, is a crucial uh, time period here because this is when you start to see many indicators. Women actually, uh, for example, education, right? Uh, women start to reach the same level as men or uh, surpassing, right? Uh, this happens with university education, but also if you start to look at many uh, professions, for example, if you look at uh, uh, the legal profession, right, the number of judges in Korea, which is an entry system, which is by competitive examination, uh, you know, the, the, the younger courts, there's many women as men or even more, same in the foreign services, for example, in, 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 in diplomacy, right? So you see many different professions with this starts uh, to happen. And you also start to see how uh, many women uh, more openly uh, are calling for equality, which is, is not new, but from the 1990s, late 1990s and 2000s uh, onwards, this, has, this becomes more open calls for uh, for n- n- not only uh, uh, the jure, but also the factor, right? Uh, and you see the laws uh, changing, they had all the to change in the 1990s, but the laws changing very rapidly to provide this the jure uh, equality, but then there's this push for the facto uh, uh, equality as well. And what I find interesting is that uh, if you look at the indicators that Korea has at the global level, of course, this is still behind uh, uh, other uh, OECD countries. Uh, that's, that's quite clear for, for, for anyone uh, to see. Uh, but at the same time, what you see is very rapid uh, increase uh, in um, uh, or rise in the standing of uh, uh, women in Korea. So issues that took many decades, you could argue if not centuries, but in the early decades in other countries to achieve, South Korean women are achieving very rapidly in, 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 our, in a sense. Uh, this is similar to the way South Korea developed economically. Uh, very rapidly. And I think we're at a point in time now when we go to, to what many say is a gender conflict within 
Korea, uh, I, I think it has to do because it has to be said, many men haven't changed their mentality, right? And they haven't realized uh, that this change uh, has uh, has happened, right? And I find this very interesting because I mentioned this towards the end of the uh, of the book, right? That the position of women obviously has improved uh, and, and many men have changed their mentality, but some others haven't, uh, actually. And I think this is the inner conflict. But I found very interesting is that uh, many women that I was uh, talking to uh, for the book, they said, well, actually, we think that the divide is between different groups of men, right? Those who have realized the change that has taken place and those that haven't realized. And I found this very interesting. And, and this would be an interesting issue to, uh, to, to explore, right? Because this is something that women themselves are talking about, right? Uh, so it would be interesting to explore in depth uh, uh, why... Why this is uh, uh, the why this is happening, and one last point about this, which I think is quite interesting, is that uh, th this process is is going to carry on, right? There is there is no turning back, uh, not only in Korea, of course, across the world to 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 uh, more traditional gender roles that really don't apply uh, anymore in most most countries, right? Uh, and I think that they should hear adaptation, right? Uh, how will society adapt to this? Uh, I mentioned, for example, that this idea that women, not only in Korea, but across uh, OECD countries, are going to go back uh, to having two kids, uh, each of them, well, is simply not going to happen. So we have to adapt to the way society has changed, and, and, and in this case, women uh, have, have changed, and this is going to happen for South Korea as well. Very, very insightful observations, Ramon. Um, so we're, we're getting toward the end of our time and the end of your book. Um, maybe <laughs> two more questions, if you can bear with me. Um, this next, again, I thought a lot about how you broke up the, the time and, and the chapter titles. And so we go from liberal South Korea to global South Korea. And I'm, I'm kind of struck by two things in that choice. Um, on the one hand, it makes sense to end liberal. You can't really continue liberal South Korea when you have two conservative presidents uh, in a row. But then again, liberal South Korea doesn't become conservative South Korea, it becomes global South Korea. And it includes, you take that all the way up to now, like we're still in the global South Korea sort of era moment. So it includes Moon Jae-in. So it's an interesting structural argument about there's something bipartisan going on here. Now, now we have another conservative, but it's like this is something uh, beyond the liberal and conservative split. Um, so l let me know if I'm understanding your argument correctly there. And then the second question here is, I, I don't know if, if you actually reflect on this. I'm not sure you mentioned in the book, but it's quite ironic that 2008 is the moment um, of kind of global South Korea because this is the global financial crisis. You know, I teach my students, this is when globalization almost falls apart in terms of a good thing, you know, and the whole kind of heyday, the party's over from 2008. And yet here, this is when South Korea kind of is all in and really begins its extraordinary. And we're, we're still, I don't know if this is the peak or they, it could go any further, but that's an amazing sort of paradox, isn't it? Or irony. So, um, yeah, I'd be curious if you also reflected on that. So those are, those are the two-part questions there about global South Korea. Yes, it is interesting because you're right about 2008, right? I mean, uh, we still have the effects today. You could, uh, you could argue in many uh, parts across the world. But you start to see the recognition of South Korea at a global level. Uh, and I think this is uh, what matters because South Korea... Uh, economically, was already uh, quite well known, but you could argue it was uh, lagging behind other uh, countries. Culturally, clearly, uh, in, in the West, it wasn't where it is today. It was in Asia, Latin America, many other parts of the world, Middle East and the Gulf countries, for example, but not at the global level. That would only come uh, a, bit, uh, a, a bit later. Uh, and, and even politically now, there is all this discussion about our democratic uh, backsliding. And some people even say, well, this is happening in, 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 in South Korea. But it's true that, you know, South Korea is a democratic country. It wasn't really <laughs> such well known, the story of the country having transitioned to uh, a democracy. It's not something that was taught, for example, right? It was all about the economic development of, of, of South Korea. And there was an afterthought that it had become democratic. 
But I think this has really changed over the past 10, 10 to 15 years. And, and yes, answering your question directly, yes, I think there is an agreement between uh, liberals and conservatives in, in, in South Korea that this is the, the, the way to go, uh, that you shouldn't stop this process. Uh, and it's interesting, but because during the uh, uh, Akuni era, right, and when there was this blacklist of artists, it's very interesting because there was a blacklist of artists and now it's a, a well-known story. But at the same time, you saw the promotion of Korean culture at the global level, right? So there was this paradox even within a presidency where there was uh, some, some, some artists that uh, were not receiving the direct support of the state, right? Uh, but clearly what you have seen uh, during this period of time is this idea most most South Koreans that this is good and that this is something they should celebrate the recognition of uh, the South Korean arts really uh, at the at, at the global level uh, and it's uh, interesting the point that you mentioned that we don't know if this is the peak right uh, I remember in uh, when when Kama style came out right uh, it was considered by many to be a one off then you know other bands came out and they became. Uh, very popular was well, but this is never, never going to become mainstream. Right? This is this is not going to happen. You know, American audiences, European audiences, uh, they, 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 don't, they don't know Korean, so why would they follow a Korean act, for example? Or they don't like subtitles. Remember that that was also mentioned mm -hmm. uh, in the past as well, right? And this clearly is not is not the case. That's why it's difficult to know where the peak uh, is, is 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 going to be, right? Um, uh, and and now we see, for example. Taking the day, you know, uh, Black Pink is to win and it's sold out already, right? So it sold out within within minutes, right? Uh, so another band may come that is even bigger, who knows, than, than Black Pink BTS, right? Um, so it's difficult to imagine, but it's true that I think this is the point in time when it became global, and I think that there were a couple of factors here. I mean, one, one of them was uh, it has uh, to be said that it's true that uh, economic globalization. If you look at the data, right? Uh, hasn't gone in reverse, like has stalled, uh, clearly, if you look at trade and investment, but not in the case of South Korea. And I think it has to do with something we mentioned before, the, the, the innovation driving the South Korean uh, economy, the fact that the goods that it is selling, right, uh, your semiconductors, electric batteries that I mentioned uh, before, other countries need them. Right. Uh, so even if they didn't want to buy them and they wanted to produce them domestically, uh, this cannot be done because it is very high tech. And South Korea is not the only country producing uh, this type of products, but it is one of them. Right. And now we see the women, for example, with uh, electric vehicles, with uh, Hyundai becoming, I think, the second largest uh, seller in many markets across the world of electric vehicles. Right. So something that is something that many consumers are going to be buying uh, into the future, and you'll see a, a Korean company being at the forefront of of this. So the, the, there is that, and I think secondly it has to be said, the second factor is that uh, I think especially younger people, not only younger people, but younger people, they're much more open-minded to to accept uh, different types of of, of uh, cultures, even if it's not in their own. Uh, language is, of course, easier to access because they access this online, right? They don't have to wait for a radio station to play their favorite song. Uh, There's many of the services they can use, right? And I think this makes a big uh, difference as well. This open-mindedness uh, from consumers across the world for, for Korean culture and products more generally has also helped. Yeah, I feel like reading your epilogue, you're you're definitely on the uh, the bullish view that we have not <laughs> seen. <laughs> We've not seen the end of this, and I would agree. All right, Roma, last question. And yes. you know, it's been a couple softballs in here. I gotta throw you, if not a hardball, a yeah. hardball. Because I would say of all the of all the parts of the argument, maybe the only one that I was like, oh, I'm not sure about that, or I may just not fully understand it, honestly but I could tell it's important. So I want to ask you about it is this notion of civic nationalism. Mm -hmm. And you argue at, at least in the nineties, I think is when you start to discuss it as emerging and you explain it kind of growing stronger and stronger. And then I'm going to read your words, quote back at you in the epilogue, you write, <laughs> uh, you write the following race matters. Yes. But so does being a good citizen. And this often takes precedence. This evolution in thinking has probably reached the point of no return. Mm 
So I was, you know, double underlining that. And it's, it's very interesting, but I am skeptical. And so I want to give you a chance. How would you convince a skeptic who sees ethnic nationalism mm -hmm. as still remaining very much predominant in terms of the basic notion of Korean identity? That is to say that, you know, what it means to be Korean is to look Korean or involves looking mm -hmm. Korean in an essential way. It's not the only part, but yeah. it is sort of an essential part. So I just wanted to challenge you a little bit and make sure if I'm understanding um, the argument. So how would you handle that? And well, then you're free. Ask, it's good to ask about it, definitely. Um, uh, I, I think uh, that there's a, a difference here, interestingly, uh, between Korean and South Korean. And that's what I found very interesting, actually, that... Um, Yes, when it comes to being uh, Korean, right, uh, I think race is essential, right? It's quintessential to, to, to the Korean uh, identity. And, and I think that cannot go away, especially, you know, as, uh, if you want unification of, 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 of Korea, right? Uh, well, that race has to be at the center uh, of it because that's the starting point of the Korean nation, right? Was the, the, the Korean identity in the Korean race. What I find interesting there is about uh, belonging to South Korea, right? Uh, being a, a, a South Korean. And it is true that race still uh, matters. I'm not neglecting that, right? But what I find interesting though, and, and I, I base this in, in, in three uh, different data, so to speak, right? Uh, one of them, uh, there's this uh, world value survey that goes back decades, right? And they ask citizens across the whole world Uh, many different countries, okay, many different questions, sorry. And they are South Koreans, right? What, what would make someone belong to South Korean society, right? And I'm paraphrasing here, but that's basically the question, right? And you see over time how people say, well, uh, yes, race is important for being South Korean, but so is actually contributing uh, to society, right? So I think that that's one of the points that I use. Uh, another one, uh, in, in, interestingly, uh, is... Uh, the growing uh, presence, uh, you know, in, 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 in the media, but in different uh, sectors as well, of uh, Koreans of different races, right? Mixed race uh, Koreans, Koreans that have been uh, brought overseas, uh, you know, and, and I think I think that matters, right? I'm not saying the representation is as good as in other places, right? Uh, I, I I don't think that's the that's the case, but I think clearly this has been changing. And the first time I lived in Korea was in, in, in Seoul. It uh, was um, almost 20 years ago, 2003, 2004. Uh, and I think it was very different uh, back then uh, compared to, to now, right? Uh, uh, back then, uh, it, it was still, um, uh, depending on your race, right? As a, a, as a foreign, you were treated in a particular way, but there was no representation, right? Uh, to, to, to speak of in the public uh, sphere, right? This, this, uh, this didn't happen. And I feel this has changed. And I think the third aspect is uh, migration, really something as simple as, as migration. Uh, and, and we tend to focus on, on uh, migrants or expats, if you want to call it that way, from, from Europe and, and the US. But most migrants in Korea come from, from, from China, from, from, from Southeast Asia, increasingly from Central Asia, right? And some of them are from uh, ethnic uh, Korean origin, right? That, the, that they migrated back in the day. Uh, but, and they are becoming increasingly part of uh, civic society uh, in uh, South Korea. Uh, many of them very well integrated, some others not, of course, right? Uh, and I think that's also changing the notion of what mean, uh, being South Korean means. So I draw this difference between uh, Korean, uh, absolutely, which I, I, I do agree, right? Race is central to that. And what being South Korean is. Uh, and I think there is a difference. Uh, there is a difference there. And the last one about this, again, young people, right? If you look at young people, uh, like uh, everywhere across the world, right? They, they are growing in a different world, right? Uh, they are growing up with uh, classmates uh, that have many different backgrounds, right? Uh, whether it's a mixed background or even a uh, foreign background, right? Uh, so their notion is very different. Uh, same with, by the way, with uh, LGBT uh, rights in, in, in Korea. I mean, these younger people, younger kids are growing up in a completely different environment, right? And that's why I think the change is 
is is is is is, is not going to reverse itself, you know, uh, because uh, this is the future of the country. Uh, and really, they're growing up in an environment that would have been unthinkable to the grandparents. But you could argue even to the parents growing up in the seventies uh, and eighties. Well, at least for someone like me, it's a it's a hopeful vision, and um, and you make a very good case. Uh, I, I mean, now I'm thinking about where you begin the story with the 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 Genesis myth of Korea and Tangun, the mm-hmm. you know very first Korean and. There's a kind of Da Munhua multicultural interpretation there. I mean, his mother's a bear, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, just, arguably the first Korean is Da Munhua, and many of uh, yeah. the current and future generation are as well, which is this interesting multicultural Korean, uh, you know, this, this very interesting, I think, sort of, I think of it as a transitional concept, you know, toward a, um, a civic uh, identity and and I'm also th- you know listening to Ramon and thinking this is this is not a this is tragic this is not a happy thing but the very difficulties with integrating North Koreans mm-hmm. which are well documented we all know into South Korea in a strange way speaks to the weakening of just that pure ethnic nationalist mm-hmm. you know identity because it's like that's actually not enough like just being the same race doesn't mean you're really South Korean and you're going to be able to fit in. And again, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but if we just kind of look coldly at, at these forces and what's happening in the changes. And as you say, uh, younger South Koreans, I mean, my students at Yonsei are as cosmopolitan is the best word I can think of in their understandings mm-hmm. of identity as anyone anywhere, the young people that I know. So, um, Ramon, taking a lot of your time. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with uh, with me. What a pleasure that I get to just ask you all these questions, and and this will be uh, shared with uh, with the Asia Society, Korea Center, you know, kind of community. And I know there's going to be huge interest, and uh, hopefully, we'll get to have you in person, and uh, everyone else can ask you their questions. So, thank you again for all your time and insight. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.